that's why we love Bitcoin, because whatever our connection to Bitcoin is, it's helping us fulfill our highest purpose, our highest use of ourselves. Bitcoin gives us the ability to protect ourselves for the long term. I have had the fear that I would be 60 and living under a bridge. Social capital is being known for doing what you say you're going to do. Social capital is beyond being trustworthy. Shift the focus from yourself and figure out how you can help other people, right? That is how you will succeed in the workplace. It is how you will succeed with a partner in a family. Most parents, and I'll make the sort of the analogy to Bitcoin, they're like central bankers. They feel like they should just get involved and they should tweak and meddle and put their influence into every situation. You're going to have to figure out how to go in there and just accept responsibility that you didn't do something. The kids these days perhaps have not grown up with all the hard knocks that my generation grew up with. They need to have sunshine and time with you and time by themselves to think. And that's it. That is all kids need to become resilient and individuals that are living a life with purpose. There has been four months since the last time we see, saw each other in the in the podcast and recorded. Um, is the, what are some highlights for you in the last four months for you personally or in, in, in the Bitcoin community? Well, my highlight was seeing your podcast with Michael Saylor. I haven't watched the whole thing yet, but it, I mean, it's such a it, it's such a privilege to witness somebody like you who's all in on Bitcoin, who's doing the proof of work, and who is succeeding. So yeah, you were telling very me nice, yeah. that like this is this podcast is number 167. That's incredible. That's not for the faint of heart, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's like definitely not a passion project anymore. It started as a passion project. I uh, started it in like uh, basically this year, I started it as a passion project. Uh, and it became this year pretty uh, serious, pretty fast. And, and I love it. And I can now just stand up every day and, and do what I love and have no fear job left. I just have this and I can actually pay my bills. And this is, uh, it's, it's been kind of amazing. And, uh, and I love to, to do exactly that. And then uh, as a bonus, I can get to interview so many great people. Uh, it's, it's really cool. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful and grateful to, to have this opportunity. And yeah, do, today I want to get into the, the topic that you had in, in Big Block Boom. Uh, I think it was Big Block Boom, I think is the conference called. And I saw a little bit of the, uh, of the uh, presentation, unfortunately not all of that, but in the beginning you said you have kind of a cheat code of raising an independent child, an independent uh, thinker. And I think you have a world-class example with Ella. Ella was also on, on my podcast already. Um, how, and, and I would, we'll just start out with the question, like, how do we raise an uh, independent thinker and not a and not, uh, conforming child in like this, this, this world we are living in right now? Yeah. It, um, I, I don't know. To say this is my favorite topic probably isn't quite the right descriptor. But, um, but I, I do feel like I have a lot of experience, um, even though a parent of one, um, you, you know, product uh, one. But I, I think the kids these days perhaps have not grown up with all the hard knocks that, not that I grew up with hard knocks, but that maybe that my generation grew up with or my parents, certainly not my grandparents. And I really began to think when Ella was little, like, how do I make her resilient so that in the event that something happened to me or something happened to her dad, she could go on and and live a life that was full and productive where she could totally take care of herself. And so I started jotting down thoughts uh, on a piece of paper, which then migrated it to my notes app in my iPhone of like things I wanted her to know. I was really convinced that I would, uh, die before she was five years old. I don't know why I used to think that, but I was really worried that I wouldn't get to tell her everything I wanted to tell her. And I wanted her to grow up to be a strong, independent woman who could take care of herself. So this, you know, guide, if you will, evolved. But really, a lot of the guide is helping her see the the world as a challenge and 
and understanding that that is the best part of the world, right? Feeling like something is really difficult or out of reach or is frightening to me is the only life worth living. Like, I feel like so many people, certainly in my circle or others that I have met, just feel like, oh, I could never move, you know, oh, our family lives here, or oh, I could never go back to work, my kids need me, or whatever the reason is that people feel like they aren't living their best life, uh, I didn't want that for her. I wanted her to have the permission, not that she needed my permission, but I wanted her to accept the challenge of like, go do a ton of things that are really scary and oh, and by the way, while you're doing them, you know, here's some tips to help you along the way. It's my opinion that most parents, and I'll make the sort of the analogy to Bitcoin, they're like central bankers. They feel like they should just get involved and they should tweak and meddle and, you know, put their influence into every situation. And in my experience, it's better when you don't, right? Because it allows your kids this struggle of, okay, how am I going to make it through the situation? And I'm not sure if I'm, I may have given this, um, I may have told this story in Bitblock Boom, I can't remember, but, um, you know, one of the earliest kind of struggles for me as a parent to not solve her problem um, was when she was, I think maybe third grade, I think it was third grade. And we live in Texas, but in the summertime, we used to go to the Northeast to a tiny little town that no one has ever heard of and just do outside things all day, right? We had no TV. There were no video games. It was a very old fashioned, you wake up, you walk to the library, you may walk to the beach. Um, you might walk to the tennis court. You might just take a walk. You might just hang out in your front yard, right? Just very 1950s existence. And it was wonderful. And I would always keep Bella home from school for the first two weeks because I didn't want to go back to Houston, you know, for an August 11th start date for school. It's still 5 million degrees in Houston. And I felt like, you know, her having the ability, us having the ability as a family to be outside somewhere and in nature and very, very active it was a better use of time than her figuring out how to line up and go to the bathroom and what class comes after lunch or, you know, all those things. So we make it back to Houston. She starts school and she says to me, oh my gosh, I haven't finished my summer math homework. I was supposed to do all this math homework and I didn't do it. Maybe it was reading. I don't remember, but I didn't do the summer homework. And I said, well, why didn't you do it? And she said, well, I, I just, I forgot. I, I just didn't do it. Uh, and she said, can you please call the teacher and just tell her that I didn't have internet or I don't know what Ella really said. I don't really remember, but she wanted me to call the teacher. And I just said, I'm not calling your teacher. You're going to have to figure out how to go in there and just accept responsibility that you didn't do something. And I mean, Ella is not a crier like ever, probably, I don't know, less than five times in her entire life. I've really seen her just boo-hoo. And she just started crying and she was like begging me, please call my teacher. I said, I'm not calling your teacher. You're gonna have to go in and tell her why you didn't do it and figure out what the consequence is. So I take her to school and I drop her off. I immediately call my mom and I tell my mom what's going on. And my mom was so mad at me. Like, how could you do that? She's such a precious little girl. It's your fault she didn't do the homework. You should have called the teacher. And I just said, mom, I, I, I cannot. Like, if you can't let your, your third grader fail and figure out their own problem, like you have problems. Right. I felt like she's in third grade. What a better time for her to screw up than in third grade when the consequence isn't huge. So, you know, the moral of the story is most people parent 
like they are lifeguards, like they're going to save their kids at every juncture. And I parented like a swim coach, you know, here's some suggestions. This is how I was able to do this, in my opinion, efficiently, right? You, when you swim, you want to swim in a very efficient manner. You don't want to put out more energy than is required and you want to get where you're going quickly. So be a swim coach, not a lifeguard. That was sort of the moral of the story, I think. I think at Bit Block Boom. You know, the other thing I would say is that, um, well, no, sorry, I'll pause. Uh, the, the the one thing that I just want to throw in because I'm a swimmer, like I was actually in a nationals level in Austria and it's, it's weird to see like all the swimmers that I saw there, they were becoming really successful. I, I don't know what it is about the swim sports, but those, uh, because swimming in Austria, like you have to be the top five people to actually live on swimming, <laughs> like five people yeah. maybe in Austria can live from swimming and the rest not, uh, because swimming is not that, not, not, not that popular in Austria and swimming teaches you a lot, like sports in general teaches you a lot, but swimming is really hard because there is no referee that has any fault. It's just you, like you, you start from uh, the starting point and then you swim and it's your lane. The, the lanes uh, um, have a frame around each other. So you just like, if, if you swam bully, if, if you did not make the time that you wanted to make, it's, it's 100% your fault. You cannot throw it on any other team member. You cannot throw it on the opponent. And, and th there's something magical about swimming. Uh, and I did swimming all my life. I think I started swimming. I think the first, my, my mom uh, forced me into swimming courses when I was like three years old, something like that. <laughs> She's like, you have to do some sports. <laughs> uh, and I loved it when I was like six, seven years old. But the first years, like uh, I was rebellious about swimming. Uh, and yeah, then I, I got to know swimming and I, and I loved it. And I, I was, I'm still swimming. Like I'm not professional yeah. anymore, but. Uh, but I'm still like uh, going to the uh, uh, swimming and like go, uh, going for some from la some lanes, and uh, it's it's amazing. It teaches you a lot of self responsibility and and accountability. Def I think that's the that's the main thing. Like if you swam badly, yeah, then then you swam badly. Then you did not train enough, and uh, that that's a great thing. Uh, uh, I mean, you also learn a lot with team sports, but there's like different things to it. Uh, and the, the question that I had, and, and I think this is, um, re a really hard one. Um, I was also like, I'm way closer to being a child than to being a parent. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm 25, so I'm, I'm still close to, to being a, a kid myself. Um, but I, I was in my civil service years that I have to do in Austria. It's, it's, it's a weird thing, but you have to have uh, one year of civil service in Austria before you can, after you can, uh, after you come out of school. Uh, and there I, I was with kids, uh, the whole day and I got to know how to handle kids. Uh, even though I was myself just like 20, 22 years old, but the kids were like at 12, 11, 10, 15, around that time frame, And it was really cool. Um, but the, the teachers there and the people that looked at after the kids were really relaxed because they saw a lot of kids. And I was not like, the, I was like, oh shit, the, the kid is running there. It, it, it will hurt itself. And I was running behind the kid and then trying to stop it. And it's not hurting the, um, uh, himself or herself. And it's, it, it was really hard for me to like, let go and, and let them make the mistake uh, because it was physical thing. Like it was not something, oh, you, you get shot at by the teacher because you don't uh, did your homework. It was actually something physical. It was like an actual danger for, um, the, the physical body. How did you, uh, and, or how do you advise to like make, let, let them make their own, uh, failures, let them, uh, put uh, their hand on the, heated uh, oven uh, 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 there's a, a favorite uh, popular saying in austria around that um and where do we have to like guide kids to a certain extent well so i think you've got to give kids power right a couple things um you have to give kids all the power for everything in their life that realistically they can have power over. So, you know, I mean, if, if a kid is running around like a crazy person, I mean, during the summer, I mean, Ella would have friends over. One of them would be, you know, outside trying to, I don't know, climb a tree or do something that would be dangerous. And I would just look at Ella and say, 
you know what? I don't feel like going to the emergency room today. Like, I'm just telling you right now that if you fall and hurt yourself, like, I don't feel like going to the emergency room. That seemed to be enough for Ella. I realized that strategy probably isn't enough for every kid to make them stop. I think she took me very seriously when I would, you know, express my consternation maybe at what what was going on. You know, we we kind of joke today that uh, the reason that she's a Bitcoiner is because I made her afraid that she was not going to have, you know, any money after she graduated from college. Right. We told her from the time she was, I don't know, maybe like six or seven or eight years old, like we will pay for you to go to college. But past that, the day after graduation, you're on your own. So what do you need to be doing in high school that will allow you to get into a college that will allow you to get the skills, degree, social capital that are required for you to go get a job that you can then afford the life that you want to live. Again, going back to the power, explaining what the real world, not consequence, that isn't the right word, but it's really hard to see into the future, I think, especially when you're little, like you're not thinking out, wow, I might live to be 90. You know, if, if, you're, if you're 10 years old or if you're 15 years old and someone says to you, you're going to be 90, how will you support yourself, right? There's some crazy statistic out there Ella shared with me this week that like 25% of kids her, you know, at your age, right, in their 20s, believe that they will inherit the wealth they need for their life, right? That is preposterous. Maybe it's a smaller percentage. I might have that slightly wrong, but but the idea that anyone in their 20s is thinking, well, someone else will take care of me, I will inherit the money, is it's sad in a way, right? Because it working for something and accomplishing something is all of the fun. So, you know, you have these really, I don't know, honest, um, thoughtful conversations with kids, you know, if you do this, this may happen, right? Like you don't say, don't do this. You say, well, if you make this choice, let's talk about what will happen. It goes back to, you know, at, at Biblock Boom, <clears throat> I gave some like, here are like the top five things or something that, um, were, that, were, that was my strategy. And strategy number one was give kids power. Right. Give kids power over every decision that is absolutely possible. So, you know, when you do that, you eliminate a power struggle um, and you allow them to mess up and you allow them to feel the consequences like the homework situation. So when they're little, right, if you're in pre-K and they come home from school and you play and whatever, do you want to take a bath? Do you want to take a shower? Do you want to make the salad? Do you want to set the table? All of these things that can make them feel like a member, uh, you know, a valuable member of your family um, that are age appropriate. And so, you know, the stakes, the stakes get higher. When Ella was, I think in second or third grade, we were having a birthday party. She got strep throat, took her to the doctor. Doctor said she really needs a shot to get over the strep throat. You know, if she wants to get over it quickly, which she did because she was having, we were having a birthday party in a few days and she doesn't like shots. What kid does? And I just said, oh, you don't have to take the shot if you don't want to. But if you're not well by Friday, we can't have your party. And, you know, I always did a big backyard, old fashioned birthday party, right? Baked cupcakes and we played games and we had water balloon flight fights and all that kind of stuff. And the doctor was horrified that I would give her the choice between the shot or the prescription medicine, the pill. And I'm like, well, but why? I mean, the, the, the benefit is to her and the consequence would be to her. So why can't she have a vote? I understand that she's in second or third grade or whatever it was. Um, you know, she went to camp. So month long camp in the summer out in the hill country in Texas, they 
fished, they rode horses, they, you know, do all those floated the river, canoed, um, all those outdoor things. And I said, that's great that you want to go to camp, but there's like 30 pages of stuff that have to be filled out, right? There's all the, the application, the health forms, the this, the that, like, you need to go on the computer and print all those out and you need to fill them all out and then I'll sign them. Right. Like by now she's in third grade or something where they're a hundred percent using computers and printing things out and filling out forms, especially with basic information. So, you know, all that to say that when it came time for Ella to do college applications, I never had to ask her when a deadline was help her with an application, print out a single you know, form, right? She did everything because the benefit was to her, the consequence was to her. So your kids need power. That's that's amazing. Um, and I think that's, I feel sometimes, uh, this is not even like parenting. This is, this is, this goes so beyond because the, the responsibility, like the reaction of the doctor and the general thing that we, we now have, it's like, we want to cuddle everyone we have to such a soft society where uh, we, we want to protect everything uh, but I, I feel like sometimes and and then we, i also saw it like i saw it in school i saw it even in work nobody wants to take responsibility like there are uh, so so many people that say like oh no you think you take the responsibility you take the blame you take everything else and if you are in in this world i mean it's a major advantage for everyone that wants to take responsibility Like there are so few people that are actually standing up for uh, whatever they are standing up for. And so many people that don't want to stand up for that. And when you want to take the responsibility and you're willing to, to stand up for yourself, stand up for a group of people, stand up for a large group of people, whatever it is, um, you have a major advantage over everyone else. Is, is that um, maybe to come a little bit back to the Bitcoin, uh, even though today will be a, a, a Bitcoin off topic, but um, is that coming to a certain extent from a fiat system where whenever there's something happening in society like COVID, we're just printing a bunch of money to fix it. Uh, is, is that uh, like the maybe even the root of, 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 of this soft society where we don't want to take responsibility. If something happens, uh, let's, let's search for a shortcut and let's, the, let, let, let take the next generation deal with it. Yeah, you're probably right. You said something really that I, I wasn't aware of, um, that you had to do civic service. Talk about yeah, that. In, 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 in Austria, um, when you like, Only boys have to do that. That's a weird thing. Like girls don't have to do it. Uh, really? There was military. Only boys in Austria have to go to military once they're done with school. So bef between school and uh, uh, before university, you have to do military. But at some point, uh, they're like, oh, we don't want to force everyone to go to military. So they had an option. Either you do six months of military or nine months of civil service. Uh, I did not want to go to the military. Uh, I, I did not care for it. it. There's actually legal consequences if you don't go to the military for the six months. Uh, it's really hard to get a gun, for example, if you don't go to military for the six months. Uh, there are like, like the actual legal consequences to that, but I did not want to do that. I wanted to go to civil service and do something social. Um, and there are some options like you can uh, care for kids, you can care for elderly people. Uh, and it's it's actually kind of lovely. I don't like that the state forces you to do that. <laughs> um, but the uh, um, experience you get from that is really cool because I was nine months, uh, it was actually in the COVID era, Uh, this was uh, when I when I did it, like yeah, now four years ago, uh, when I did that and I was there, like I was the guy that uh, looked after kids. I was the guy I was going to um, to the elderly homes. I was even the IT guy uh, driving a car from that to that. Like I did everything in, in like a, a, in, in that organization uh, because they got to know like, oh, I know IT, uh, I'm good with kids. Uh, I don't 
uh, I, I can joke with elderly people like they, they saw, okay, he, he can do everything and then they, they throw it around wherever they, <laughs> wherever they meet me. Uh, and it was a good experience. Honestly, I would not like to miss it, even though I'm really not a fan of that the, the state forces you to do something. Um, but that one is, is, is quite okay. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's in the Austria law and it's definitely only for boys. Girls can, um, uh, voluntarily do, do that too. Um, and yeah, there was even recently, I think like five, six years, there was a vote if we should, um, uh, delete this law and if we should not have this anymore. And the population said, no, we, we want that. Like, uh, population said like 53%, like a little bit mi a minority said, uh, we want to have young people in the civil service and in the military, uh, for, yeah, six months or nine months, uh, in after school. This, this is not happening in America, right? No, it's not happening in America. And, and I love that they, that you do that, right? Because I, I think at the, you know, your question, you know, is this a consequence of fiat? I think what is a consequence of fiat is that we're, that we think about ourselves all the time, right? Like we think about what our needs are or how we are being treated or the things that are happening to us that whole narrative is a very fiat narrative and I wholly reject it. I, I, re I reject the, you know, that your kid has to be in all sorts of, you know, organized activities after school. Oh, they've, well, they've got to be in this club or they've got to be in that club or they have to take these STEM classes or they have to do like, I, I reject the notion that these things will, make a productive person in society. I think what makes a productive person in society is precisely um, what you're talking about, which is shift the focus from yourself and figure out how you can help other people, right? That is how you will succeed in the workplace. It is how you will succeed with a partner in a family Right. What is it that you can do to contribute or to to lift the burden from someone else? And that's what you've done. I wish we'd do it here in America. I think that we wouldn't go to war. I, I don't think that that folks in <clears throat> in the power, you know, the powers that be would vote for war if they knew that they had to send their children, grandchildren, nephews, um, you know, in, into, into battle. How, how high is the, how big is the volunteer work in, in America? Because in Austria, we have really a lot of volunteer, volunteer work. For example, the fire department has a professional fire department, but also a separate volunteer fire department, which is really big in Austria, like the culture of like, Almost everyone in Austria, not everyone, like a, a, a huge portion of society in Austria has something like they are in, in, in uh, the fire department also on, on the side just to help out. Uh, some, I have some, some English words are not in my mind, but uh, some Samariterbund is, is there. Like there are a lot of uh, um, things where we can help each other out. And it's actually quite a, a high percentage of, of uh, people that do those kind of things. For fire department especially is really um, an, an a yeah, popular one. Uh, and if, I don't know if, if this comes from this like uh, olden Austrian economics thought and, and this like, it would be interesting to, to dig, a little, dig, deep, dig a little deeper in the in history and, and see where it's coming from. But it's, it's is that also in, in uh, America, a big thing where we uh, volunteer work at the fire department, volunteer work and in, in uh, uh, I forgot that the word, sorry. Not that I know <laughs> Not that I know of. I, I think that it's, I can just say from my own experience, um, it's very difficult to volunteer places, right? There are organizations that you can join <clears throat> that then have relationships with um, other organizations where you can go volunteer. But I, I, um, I'm not aware. I think that's amazing. Volunteer fire department. Uh, I mean, that's, that's real work, theoretically. 
right? You're not just pushing a cart down a hallway of a place or, um, no, I don't know that again, like, again, I think if we were, if, if we lived in a world more focused on service, we'd be living in a different world. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack. If you use code Robin, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel and uh, now let's get back to the video absolutely yeah um maybe coming a little bit back to the uh topic uh that for, for me this was also something big like my i was not allowed to have any uh digital computers or digital things uh more than half an hour till i was like 14 years old like pretty old uh now like 12 years old have like all the data the phone and stuff like that but i was always like Again, like, no, you don't have your phone till, uh, like, I did not have, I don't know, when did I get a phone? I don't know, 12, 13, something like that. Uh, but I only had, like, half an hour of, of digital work per day. There's, like, PlayStation or TV, like, any things of that, but only half an hour. Um, and till 16, I had, like, only one hour. This kind of incentivized me or forced me to be a lot in nature, And I had a farm next to me where my uncle was. And I was, I think, yeah, till like 15, 16 years old, like every day there. I was helping out in the farm. I was helping out there. And I did always a lot in, in, in nature. And uh, I think that's one reason why I'm, I'm, I'm barely sick these days because I got a lot of outside work. Um, is, and you also mentioned it before with Ella where you are outside and, and did that stuff. Um, how important do you think is, is that being, being in nature and being outside? And, and I also see it with Bitcoiners nowadays when, when I talk with them, they're like touch grass. This is like a big meme also in the Bitcoin community, being outside, doing something. Uh, how, how important is that for like uh, kids? Well, I think it's important for everybody. I, I didn't, <clears throat> my perception was that a phone would never be a good idea for Ella. She didn't get one until she was in eighth grade. Uh, and the only reason she did is because she made the varsity golf team and they traveled and I wanted her to be able to call me if she needed me. <clears throat> But we gave her like one of those old flip phones. So she didn't even have really the ability to text. Obviously she went away to boarding school as a freshman in high school. So she did take a phone with her, but it, We, we didn't have technology. In the summertime when we would go away, there was no technology, zero. No televisions, no computer time, no cell phone. Like it was a no technology summer and you didn't miss it at all, right? None of our neighbors were technology people. Like the entire community where we lived was free of technology, it just is not a thing. But I didn't realize until really, I mean, so uh, from like 2017 until 20, early 2021, I lived um, on a tiny little island in the, on the East Coast, uh, very 1950s, 60s, 70s, whatever the decade is that you want to say it was like, um, you know, very, outdoorsy, focused, community oriented, kind of a blue collar place, really. Um, it did a lot of service people that worked on houses in Newport, Rhode Island, um, lived where I lived. I spent most of my days outside working in the garden, hauling dirt, remediating soil, planting bulbs, um, pulling weeds, cutting grass, planting trees. It was marvelous. I was so 
happy. And I didn't really realize until, you know, kind of, I don't know, the last six or eight months looking around Houston going, God, there's like something missing. Like, I don't feel as well as I felt four years ago. And it's not a health related and it's not necessarily a mental health related, but there's something missing. And I, and I started to like go, okay, what am I doing differently? You know what it is? I'm never outside in Houston. It's so hot here. I'm rarely outside. I'm never outside for the, for being outside, right? I may leave my, I live in a high rise, leave my building, get in my car, drive somewhere, go inside. I spend zero time touching grass. Like there, that is a thing like that. There is a hundred percent connection between the energy in your body and the amount of time that you spend outside. So I'm figuring out how to get out of Houston or how to how to find the ability to spend more time in nature because I think it's really important. And I think that it's um, it affects us I th- at a cellular level. It's like it, we have to have it. It's an ingredient in a diet that we have to have. Yeah, I think uh, um, getting sunlight and getting... A uh, grass in your like I love the feeling of barefoot grass. <laughs> it's it's something uh, pretty spectacular. I, I love it a lot. Um, you, you also brought up the topic of social capital, and uh, I heard it from you, and I heard it from some some other people. Um, how do you define social capital? Because I f- feel like that's really important, and maybe that's that Bitcoiners are like. Once they figure out the capital with Bitcoin, they go ahead and then they learn a lot. They, they do a lot. They, they learn a lot for their social capital. And I feel like even the social capital is probably way more important than the actual capital that you have because with social capital you can get the other capital back. How do you define the the social capital and and and, and how do you uh, build it? Social capital is being known for doing what you say you're going to do. Social capital is it's it's beyond being trustworthy. There's a there's a TED talk I would recommend that that you watch or your audience watches. Um, I saw it in in 2013, I think 2013 maybe 2015. It's by a woman named Meg J, and it is about why it's titled "Why 30 is Not the New 20." and it talks about how 20 somethings are really struggling to find their purpose. And they think that it's okay to do, to, to, uh, you know, taking on serious stuff until their thirties, you know, I'll get a serious job when I'm 30, I'll go into a serious relationship when I'm 30, I'll start thinking about where I really want to live when I'm 30. I'll look for life's meaning when I'm 30. I wholly reject that right? The time, time is precious. And from a monetary standpoint, I mean, the difference, everyone's heard this, but the difference between starting to save at 15 versus 25, right? If you, if you put money into a tax preferred retirement account, beginning at 15 versus beginning at 25, like it's a profound difference. You know, I felt like it was a must that Ella work when she turned 15. Um, again, we were, you know, spent our summers in this tiny little place and there really was no industry other than, you know, kind of a bakery and a coffee shop and an ice cream shop. And, um, and there were a lot of kids there and a lot of the kids there worked. And the only job she could get was kind of the late shift at the ice cream place where she worked, I don't know, for maybe like six or seven o'clock at night until midnight and she was the new kid. And so she had to mop the floor and, you know, kind of do all the things that she would come home and her tennis shoes would just reek. They would smell so bad because she, you know, mopping and cleaning and um, her shoes would get wet. And it was just like, but she loved that job. She loved making her own money and she loved at the end of the summer being able to fund you know, a small portion, but some of her uh, retirement savings account because she had built a spreadsheet because we weren't 
you know, she knew that when she graduated from college, there would be no stipend from her parents, right? So she she had long before she got this job, she sat down and figured out, okay, um, you know, if I do this, what, you know, how will this pan out financially? At what, what age can I retire? How much money do I really need to live my whole life? Like, there isn't anyone listening to this show, Robin, that can't figure these things out, right? That is like simple math on an Excel spreadsheet. Maybe you're using, you, you are using a compound compounding calculator to make some of these estimates, but like, why isn't, why aren't kids when they're 13 or 14 thinking about these things, right? Because when you are, then you know why at 15, which is the earliest that she could get a job um, legally, you know why it's a must that you get a job starting at age 15. You realize the impact this will have on your life. But, you know, if parents feel like their kids don't need jobs and their kids deserve the summer off and, oh, my kids work so hard during the year, you really put them at a disadvantage. Right? You put them in a place where they feel like, well, now I'm 25 and I can't go scoop ice cream. Like that's beneath me or I can't go do whatever job that's beneath me. But I would say if you are 25 and you're not Robin Sayer, who's killing it, making 167 podcasts and working 24 hours a day. Like if you're looking for what your purpose is, just go start somewhere, go take a job and show up every day and do a great job <clears throat> and be the person that's dependable. That reputation really follows you. And, you know, I love saying that I started working when I was 14 years old. I mean, I did take years off when Ella was little, but like, you know, as a middle-aged person, I love looking back and going, you know, I've been working since I was 14 and this is honestly a privilege from God that we get to work, right? But working isn't a burden. We are meant to do something. We are put here to be good humans and to be of service to others and to fulfill our highest purpose. And I think so many of us in Bitcoin, that's, that's why we love Bitcoin, because whatever our connection to Bitcoin is, it's helping us fulfill our highest purpose, our highest use of ourselves. Right? And you get to help others. Um, while also, you know, as Peter McCormick says, <clears throat> becoming uh, magically rich with this magic internet money. So it's a total win. I mean, I and say it's that lovely. Because it's, it's not, you know, I don't think any, I, I think at this point we are not sitting on podcasts uh, for the number of web technology. We, we are here realizing, as you pointed out earlier, that the decay of society is because of the decay of the value system, because of the decay of fiat, etc. And it's, it's starting early. This compounding effect is amazing because with money, you see it so great because you like can actually track it and you can track the numbers and everything. You can g get a nice graph in. But I think what is even better when you have actual um, when we work on this social capital and when we're, we're going out, we're working, we're doing something, we're networking, we're, we're putting some work in, whatever the, the work is in the end of the day, we are getting experience. And I'm just 25, but uh, I started also my first work when I was 16, 17 years old. Uh, and the last job I had that I quitted, uh, I think, uh, three, four months ago, I was six years there. I started there as a software tester who is just clicking uh, buttons to try to break a software. Uh, that's basically the job of a software de tester. I went ahead and went to software development, managed service, and I had my own clients that had a huge amounts of, of revenue for the for the company. I was sitting right next to the CEO. I was getting giving a lot of responsibilities. But I was one of the youngest. I think there's only one guy that was younger than the company there than me. And we were like 25 people or something like that. Uh, and that's 
only because I always search for res responsibility. They always wanted to have more. Like I, I said uh, in the first internship I made there uh, to to the CEO there, I want to have I want to uh, work with you in sales. I want to have uh, um, a clients of my own. I, I did not even how I did not even know how to code, uh, and uh, I, I wanted to have. But I made this from the beginning clear that I want to have responsibility, and then I went ahead and did like three years of software testing, software development. I, I learned my way into the company because when you are 18, you have no clue about working. Uh, at least I did not have. <laughs> uh, I think most don't have, uh, and so like I had six years of experience, uh, and I, I see it now with 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 my girlfriend, and she's she's amazing. She's also now working, uh, but she did not work a lot uh, till now. Like she's now starting out. She's in, in the same age, and she studied a lot, and. The, the, the things that she's now starting to, to learn when she's working, I learned when I, I was 18 years old. That there are just the things that you cannot learn in university. There are things that you really have to learn when you are in the work, when you're actually working within a team, when you're working, when there's money involved with other people. Like the, you actually have to have a deadline. Otherwise, there's like something on the line. Because in, in school, it's like, okay, you there's a deadline. Yeah, you... You, the, the teacher might not be happy, but there's no no real world consequence to that. There's just like your teacher is not happy. But if you screw up something in the company, there's actually some real world consequences to that uh, that you realize. So like, I, I gained a lot of like, I think the money part was secondary to me um, uh, because I was uh, lucky that I grew up in a very uh, well protected uh, family, and and I always felt like secure with money even though i was on my own since uh, 18 19 years old because i had to because my, my parents had a similar uh mindset and knew that like okay w once he started working once he finished his school he he can now uh, live <laughs> live off his own uh thing mm -hmm. and i think that's very valuable like getting the knowledge and, and the social capital building this social capital really early on of course like the the money part is also great if you can build it uh, really early on but the social capital that this accumulates so fast and you 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 have so many great experiences then and and, and yeah it's i have no question here but uh, I, this is what i wanted to just uh, share and, and uh, uh, give you as input yeah i love that i what was your girlfriend doing before why was she not working <laughs> I mean, she was working. Uh, she's coming. Uh, she has a. Uh, she, she's come from India, uh, so she m made her way from India to h here. Uh, in India, she has very uh, protected uh, parents, uh, but nice. now she's on her own. She she wanted to actually break out of this, uh, being well protected from the parents uh, and like in Indian parents are like uh, what I know from from her and her parents are even. Uh, really good from that but uh, outside of that like they're they're really especially when they're girls really protected of her like it's it's a whole nother level than we have in america and then we have in uh in in austria or in the western civilization it's it's a whole nother level i yeah i i learned a lot about the culture <laughs> already uh and 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 now she's she's doing that yeah uh, but it's it's uh definitely a parents thing yeah it's uh uh that um yeah perfect then uh i had some some more things i want to like okay yeah the, the one question that I, I had down uh um, homeschooling that i really want to get into you because we are we're coming closer to the end um i think uh ella said like, like no to homeschooling i think we talked about that even in the last podcast um What's what's your take now on homeschooling? Because I think homeschooling is really cool, but there's like this social thing uh, where then your kid is not like it's in, it's your home and you have like she has to care or the kid on uh, has on himself uh, has to care for his social structures. Like when you're in the school, you get to know friends, and uh, then when you're homeschooling, um, you have only the social circle around you and you have to like go in the neighborhood and find friends on your own um do, do you see like homeschooling as like the more and more the future where we collect or organize ourselves in in, in smaller areas and and less in the schools yeah well there are a couple things I, I don't know um probably not i don't think that in and i and i would say everything that i've said is strictly an american perspective 
I fully understand um, what you were saying about your the the family dynamic in which your girlfriend grew up in. Um, so my my perspective is obviously only American. But if our entire world is falling apart, and if inflation continues, and if money becomes less valuable, that pushes people into more stressful places, into more work, into more jobs. So who's homeschooling these kids, right? You have to have a certain level of financial stability in, able to be, in order to be able to homeschool your children. Somebody has to be the one homeschooling the kids unless um, I, I have some good friends who had five kids and um, and I think there were maybe four families that got together with all of the kids and took turns um, teaching those kids and, and all of those kids were homeschooled, I think, um, through high school. Amazing kids. They got into amazing colleges. But I, I mean, I see that as being rare, right? It's a it's a privilege to be able to homeschool your kids because it means that you have some level of financial safety. I don't think that the um, perception maybe that homeschool is less of anything is just uneducated. I have a really um, a dear friend who was actually my public speaking coach. So an incredible public speaker, uh, public speaking coach. She had a couple of award-winning podcasts um, on public speaking. And she had twin girls who she had homeschooled their whole lives. And they were just a couple of years younger than Ella. And I remember she called one day and said, you know, the girls are really interested in speaking to Ella about boarding school. They know that she's had this great experience in boarding school, um, but you know, I, I, so they'd like to speak to Ella, but I'm really worried because I don't think they'll get into a boarding school because they've been homeschooled. And I said to her, I, you know, first of all, there's boarding schools for all kinds of kids. So, you know, I think what we have in our mind, at least in America, is this, um, you know, very like that the, the academic rigor is um, that academics are, you know, very structured and, and difficult. And, um, but there's, there are tons of boarding schools all over the world that, that serve different needs of different kids. And so I was explaining this to her. So her kids get on a call with Ella and maybe another call, maybe another call. And they decide to make application to some boarding schools. Well, Robin, the number one boarding school in the United States is Andover. George Bush went there. You can Google it. It's got an incredible reputation. Both of her daughters got full scholarships to Andover. And they went, right? Now, this is a mom who said to me, I don't think that my girls will ever get in because, you know, they were homeschooled. As though, like, homeschooling somehow implies that it's less rigorous than a regular school. I think if we really consider what goes on in a regular school, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of time just standing in line and figuring out what class to go to next and line up to go to recess and line up to go to lunch and, you know, just all the garbage sort of discipline that they do. And the it's, I don't know, I begged Ella to home, be homeschooled. Um, and she just, she was happy at her school and, um, and it was fine, I guess. But at the end of the day, she was my child. And so I, I would say that to parents, it's like they're your kids. You don't need to take them to an after school activity every day. They don't have to be on, you know, team sports if they don't want to. Like they need to have sunshine and time with you and time by themselves to think. And that's it. That That is all kids need to become resilient and and individuals that are living a life with purpose. And when you fill their lives with all of these different activities, you're basically saying you have to stay busy in order to live a life of purpose, which I wholly reject. I think that having time to think 
is what has brought all of us into Bitcoin, right? If we had all been in a swim at a swim meet or in a, at a soccer match or in something, we wouldn't have spent hundreds of hours on this topic that we hold so dear. So kids belong to parents and they belong to families and spending time with them is, is more impactful than anything else that you'll do. And which, you know, again, like is the reason why I would send Ella back to school two weeks late every single year, maybe three weeks late some years. Um, I would often pick her up in the middle of the day. There was, um, yeah, I mean, there, there was a week a year that I would literally drop her off for two hours in the morning. And then there was an event that happened in Houston. There was a tennis tournament that happened in Houston and we were tennis fans and we would go camp out in the stands and watch this, these great tennis players come through Houston once a year. I mean, like she'd go to school two hours a day and then, you know, we'd stay at the tennis thing until it ended at nine o'clock at night. Like they're yours, right? They, she's mine. I wanted to spend time with her um, before the, then, you know, go ahead. And th I think this is a really uh, good point because uh, a lot of parents are like, you have to be in school, you have to play by the rules, you have to be on time. And I think uh, this really teaches a kid when you take her out or bring her a little later that you don't always have to play exactly by the rules. You can like, you can make your own judgment call. You can make your own decisions. You, it's, it's, it's still your life. Even if you are in a system that maybe doesn't want to, because probably most of the kids in, in her skill, I don't know how it is in America, but in Austria, uh, for, <laughs> it is like that. And most of the kids in school, They were brought in uh, at time and they they were the, the whole time here. And I was also like that weird kid in school, especially to the end where I could sign my, my own things and I don't, didn't have to go to my mom for that. I was there like half the time if it comes high, but I was one of the best in the, in the class because I just was a quick learner, uh, but I was not there a lot. And, and, and teachers were like, Oh, you have to come uh, and, and you have to come. But there were also the, 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 the few teachers that say like, Oh, and you don't have, like, you're obviously a good uh, student. You're doing your homework. You're doing your uh, projects. You're doing everything fine. Of it, like, this was an age where above 15 to 18. This was this, this time range. And they're like, ah, oh, okay. If, if, if you're not here, it's, it's fine. Like, you, you, you obviously learn something here in school. You're doing your things. Why should you, like, you're not here to sit in school. You're here to learn something. And I think this gets sometimes a little lost. And we, like, no, no, you have to sit in school. You have to obey the rules exactly. You're not here to learn. You're here to sit. And I, I, I like that a lot, bringing the, the kid a little later in school and picking her up uh, in the middle of the day. It's, it's, I think it teaches her uh, on a very subconscious level, extremely something important to, to set your own rules and set your own decisions. Well, I don't, I, but why do we think that school, if we don't go to school, why do we think that that's breaking the rules, right? Like they're not in prison. They're not in a work camp. I mean, they're, they're there to learn, right? We're teaching them how to be a productive human being, right? We're giving them skills so that they can go out and have interesting conversations and hopefully solve really hard problems because we have a lot of them. I, I, I just, I just reject the, we're breaking rules when we don't send our kids to school from X hour to Y hour every day. Like we can't continue to think that way and expect different results. Yeah. Full heartedly agree with that. And I think this uh, round the one hour mark also now it's a, it's a great way uh, to end this podcast. This was one of the podcasts where I try a little bit of off topic of Bitcoin. Like usually I'm, I'm only on Bitcoin, but I, I try to get like some off topics in and I even start soon uh, a Bitcoin business hour where like once a week uh, uh, or maybe every second week I get someone in and we only talk about how to scale something, how to do something. I want to get more things out of uh, out of Bitcoin also in, in the podcast. And I think this was a very important uh, topic. Uh, let's see how, 
how the community reacts to that. Let's see how, how people like it. Uh, thank you, uh, Lisa, for, for doing that uh, with me and, and, and bringing something new to the table. Um, before we get uh, off, uh, we have an end routine in the podcast, as you know, uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest. And this is, again, a Bitcoin question <laughs> uh, from the previous guest. And the previous guest asked you, uh, what is your goal with Bitcoin? Why are you stacking? Um, well, I, you know, I said this on the Breed Love podcast. I have had the fear that um, I would be 60 and living under a bridge, right? And I, I feel like Bitcoin gives us the ability to protect ourselves for the long term. It's it doesn't require that you have gone to school and sat through classes and, and followed those rules. It doesn't require that you have become a financial engineer. It doesn't require that you are, um, you know, you have all these letters after your name. It doesn't require any of that. It is just the safety net so that I, it, for me, it's the safety nets, frankly, so that I can just go live my life and go work in a garden and remediate dirt and plant dahlia bulbs and think about things I want to think about and read interesting books and talk to interesting people. Right. It's, it's like my ticket to be able to do that. I don't want to spend my time watching CNBC or talking to a financial advisor about whether or not we beat the index by 1% or 2%. I don't find any of that use of time productive or engaging, right? Like Bitcoin just lets you shed all of the preconceived notion, again, that you must follow this prescribed path. So that's why I stack. I, I love that a lot. Um, perfect. Then uh, before I let you go, where can people uh, find you? Where can people reach out to you if they have questions? I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on my website, lisahuff.io. Um, thank you for having me, Robin. I really enjoyed chatting with you again. And congratulations on all your success. I, I'm thrilled for you. And I'm thrilled to be number 167. Amazing. Perfect. And let's do another, another one at like 270 something. <laughs> let's see Perfect. when we do another one. Uh, thank you everyone also for watching and listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.